Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta, and this is Consistent Preterism. Thank you for joining me today. Today, I'm going to be doing something a little different. Um, I'm going to be doing a critique slash roast slash uh, comedic roast, I guess you would call it, of a man named John Pretlove. And uh, he's a pastor at the First Baptist Church of the Lakes in Las Vegas. And the reason why I'm doing this is because uh, a friend, commenter on one of my videos has requested that I do this uh, on one of his videos so that he could then pass it along to some of the people that are on the fence that attend this church, I guess. Um, and it is his old church, so that it's near and dear to his heart. And so he sent me a link of this guy. And boy, oh boy, let me tell you, this guy is a clown. Um, and so I figured it worthy to uh, do a little critique. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. You're going to notice as I let this man's presentation run through and I comment and stop it and comment uh, that this guy really has no clue what he's talking about. Okay, He is doing newspaper exegesis as he looks at the world events uh, and, and talks about the health care budgets and things like that. And he's tying it in with the Bible. And the man is just a total bonehead. All right. Um, you know, and he's got this English accent, which makes it all the more funny. Now, you know, a lot of people would probably think, you know, ignorant people would listen to this man. And because he has an English accent, they would automatically think that he knows what he's talking about and he must be smart. But boy, oh boy, is this man dumber than rocks. So uh, I'm going to give a little critique here. It's His presentation is about 35 minutes long. Um, he doesn't really touch upon much scripture, only a few places he does, but boy, does he botch them. So I'm going to be focusing on that. I'm going to offer up some commentary on other things and show you why he's absolutely wrong. So yeah, let's just get right into it so we can keep this thing, uh, relatively, uh, concise. And, um, we're going to just show you how confused, uh, this futurist preacher actually is, okay? It doesn't matter how many years a man has been in the Bible. It doesn't matter any of that, right? It it, um, it really just matters, you know, how intelligent he is, how honest he is, how, uh, how he keeps things in context and lets the Bible speak for itself, um, you know? And, and of course, that type of teaching is not very popular because it kind of cuts people out of the game. But um, yeah, we're going to look at this and, and pick through it. Now, of course, in, in this, it's, it's interesting because uh, his name is Pret Love, but you're going to see that he's got nothing but hate for Prets. Uh, he doesn't like Preterists, all right, even though his last name is Pret Love. I find that kind of funny. Um, but he doesn't like Preterists. He hates the Preterist view, uh, and he is, is talking about it, not giving any really good proofs <laughs> and ignoring a, a whole multitude of passages that prove Preterism. Um, but yeah, he's going to talk a little bit about that and, um, you know, he's going to growl a few times, which is very disturbing. This man actually growls, uh, talk about demon possessed. You're going to hear a couple, uh, points in the video where a, a voice comes out of this man that surely sounds like a growling demon. It's quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, of course I don't believe in demons, but just, you know, for the sake of just getting a good chuckle, you'll pick up on it as soon as you hear it. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting. But, um, all right, enough about all that. Let's get right into it. This is uh, Pastor John Pretlove from First Baptist Church of the Lakes out in good old Las Vegas, Nevada. Dr. Pretlove, I shouldn't call you doctor, Pastor Pretlove with the English accent, take it away. We read in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to eternal life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. In a now, before we get started here, I just got to get, get to the bottom of this passage that he's quoting from Daniel 12. Notice how he starts in verse 2, okay? He says, and many of those who sleep... By the way, that was how his sermon began. I didn't cut anything out. I just picked up right there. Um, but it says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and contempt. Now, you notice how he skipped over verse 1, right? He didn't, didn't say anything about it. But let's read verse 1 so we catch it in context and see who it's actually speaking about. It says, At that time, Michael shall stand up, who I believe is Jesus, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. Your 
people. Okay, now here's Jesus standing watch over the sons of your people. He's called the prince. Obviously, the prince would be the son of the king or the father, I guess. Uh, and then it goes on. He says, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Hmm. Your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. All right. So clearly there's a context here to who's going to be raised and who's going to rise out of the dust of the earth. It's your people, Daniel, your people. Okay. This is, this is Daniel prophesying about his people. There was going to be a resurrection of his people. All right. And there was going to be a time of trouble that led up to that resurrection, right? But such as never was since there was a nation. And obviously we see in the, uh, last days of the New Testament in Revelation that the ones redeemed came out from the Great Tribulation period. We know when that was, and we'll get into that in a little while here, um, but it's them coming out and there was going to be a resurrection of the just and unjust. Now, we know all throughout the New Testament, we have all this expectation that there is literally about to be the resurrection of the just and unjust. Paul said it, John said it, Jesus said it, everybody said it. They were in the last days. That's why they were in the last days, because they were about to be raised, some to life, some to everlasting shame. Now, I will say that there are some who believe that Daniel 12 is speaking of the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. If that's your view, that's okay, okay? I personally still believe that Daniel 12 is literally a prophecy of the end time, of the final end, because there's just too many things for me to uh, to lock into Revelation and to tie in to show that it did carry on to the very end. But either way, it doesn't matter. I'm not arguing that point here. What we can agree on, at least, is that at the very latest, at the very max this prophecy could go, would be AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem, right? Because if you believe it, it was a Greek uh, prophecy, Cool, right? If you believe it was the end of, of AD 70 and the coming of the Lord prophecy and the final end, cool, right? No matter what, we can both agree that that is the very farthest that it could go, which obviously makes this guy, John Pretlove's arguments, totally dumb, all right? But um, so, yeah, this is taken out of context by this guy um, because he's applying something that was about Daniel's people. It was the promise of resurrection, which was only made to the 12 tribes. Um, and the the uh, the covenant people. It was their promise. It was what they serve God earnestly day and night, hoping to attain, said Paul in Acts 26. And this man is applying it to himself today. But let's continue. In other words, the resurrection of the, of the dead and judgment. Looking, of course, at the second coming, So there in chapter 12, verse 2, you've got the second coming. And when you go on in the chapter, you get the talk of times, of a time, times and half a time um, in verse 7, which is the traditional way of talking about the length of the tribulation period. So what you have obviously got in this chapter is the second coming in verse 2 and the tribulation in verse 7 from which it is deduced that the second coming comes before the tribulation and indeed was in AD 17 so I'm not really sure what he's saying here, but it seems like what he's saying is that the second coming in Daniel 12 is in verse 2, right? Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and contempt. All right, and then he's, I think what he's saying is that the great tribulation comes after the second coming, okay? But that's just stupid, all right? That doesn't work in any other, in any place in the Bible, never mind this place, all right? Um... What we see here is that the time times and half a time is sh sure. That's the tribulation, the final tribulation period. I guess what most people believe that is, is a period of three and a half years. Um, and what we have to understand is that Jesus in the last days in Matthew 24 comes and says that you will go through much tribulation. He's giving his Olivet Discourse. 
He's telling them all these signs and things that would come against them. He says in verse 9, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive because lawlessness will abound. The love of many will grow, grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. All right, he says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation. Such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. Okay, so again, he's pulling from Daniel there, talking about the great tribulation like no nation would have ever seen. But he's, Jesus is going through the signs and the tribulation that they would go through. He's speaking to real people here. He's not speaking to John Pretlove, okay, in Las Vegas. He's speaking to real people as he's giving this discourse on the Mount of Olives. Okay, and then he says in verse 29, as he's going through this entire discourse, he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the land will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds. He says this, now, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, here it is, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Now, what was all these things? Well, it was every single thing that he had just gotten done speaking about. All right. Don't let any moron try to fool you into thinking that the word generation there means 2,000 years. Okay. The word is genia. And it literally, every time it's used in the New Testament, some 23 times or so, it always refers to the generation living at that time. It never refers to a period of 2,000 years, which is completely asinine on the highest degree to suggest that the word generation or a generation or this generation means 2,000 years. Okay? Totally, totally dumb. All right, so Jesus is very clearly saying that everything that he just said, including the tribulation, including them persecuting them and being hated by all names, by all nations, including many will be offended and betray one another, including seeing the abomination of desolation, including the elect being gathered up at the last trumpet. Every single thing that he just said was going to take place in this generation. Okay, that includes the coming and that includes the great tribulation that Pret love here said comes after long after the coming right these guys have no clue all right so jesus says everything would take place so the great tribulation folks began when jesus sent his people out his disciples out they were going on a mission to seek the elect jesus warns them that they will go through tribulation like they wouldn't believe Okay, and then at the very end, we can see in other places, like in Revelation, that there would be a period where the uh, adversaries would be loosed for a little while and would bring about great tribulation in that final short, I believe, time, time, and half a times, which was basically, if the three and a half year uh, assumption is correct, that would have been the last three and a half years, which by golly was actually the Jewish Roman War. <laughs> And that would cap off this period of about 40 years, which matches the wandering in the wilderness before the Israelites inherited the literal promise, the, the physical promised land back in the Old Testament. But there's a period of 40 years here where they're wandering, they're, they're seeking the elect, and they're going to inherit their spiritual promised land at the end, at the coming, when he comes for them. Okay, so the great tribulation took place before the coming of the Lord. All right. And then the coming caps it off when they are finally raised, taken up into heaven, changed into those immortal glorified heavenly bodies at the last trump. All right, so this guy is completely confused. But let's continue. And I'm sorry that it's very boring. This is a very, very boring sermon. I will just uh, give you that heads up. I mean, this guy can put people to sleep. 
with that accent and how long he takes to get his thoughts out. But here we go. Listen. Listen. A text without a context is a pretext. A text without a context is a pretext. Isn't it interesting how a futurist is arguing about context, right? They have no right to be arguing about context. These guys ignore context like it's the plague. And as verse 2 is being used to say that the second coming has happened and indeed happens before the great tribulation is is the fault of Stephen Langton here comes a growl, get ready for it. Archbishop of Canterbury in the 13th century. You say, huh? Yeah. He divided the chapters wrongly. Did you hear that? He divided the chapters wrongly. This guy's uh, possessed, right? He don't got the Holy Spirit. He's got something else. But, so now he's blaming somebody else for dividing the chapters wrongly and all that. But again, I just showed you that the Great Tribulation took place. Actually, the, the Tribulation period took place for the entire last generation. It was their Tribulation. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 here as he's writing to the Israelites in Corinth. He says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, the Father of mercies and all comfort, who comforts us in all of our Tribulation. That way that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Ready? For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, that's tribulation, so our consolation also abounds. Now, if we are afflicted, there's more tribulation, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the sufferings which we also suffer. Tribulation, okay? All over this. He says, or if we are comforted, it is for your cons consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, you will also partake of the consolation. Okay, now this is the tribulation, folks. They're going through it. Paul is going through it. Peter said in Acts, through much tribulation, we, we first century saints must enter the kingdom of God. So this guy says, you know, a, a text without a context is a pretext, yet he's ignoring the entire context. Do you realize that when, when Jesus commissions them, they go out, he tells them, you're going to be through, go through much tribulation, right? He's talking to literal people. And then as we look in the book of Acts and we see the literal acts of those literal same people that Jesus spoke to, the apostles, the disciples, we see that they're going through much tribulation. Peter says, through much tribulation, we first century saints must enter the kingdom of God. Paul is telling the saints in Corinth that they were going through much tribulation and God was comforting them and helping them persevere. Jesus said, he who perseveres to the end will be saved. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will go to all nations and then the end will come. Well, what end was that? It was the coming of the Lord, the destruction of the temple and the end of the age. And he said, all these things will take place in this generation to whom I'm speaking to. Not the generation of pret love as he goes to the casino at night. Okay? It's that generation to whom Christ was speaking to. So this guy has absolutely no clue which way is up. And he's growling. He shouldn't have divided the chapter where he did. He should have divided it after verse 3. Oh, okay. So that's the secret. He should have divided it after verse 3. Look. Look. When, when I was hearing from more than one angle that the preterists were using this passage in this way to say that the second coming had already happened, I looked at it. And I said, what on earth is going on here? 
So I looked. I looked at my commentaries. I've got a commentary on Daniel from a great old uh, millennial guy. You ever wonder why these guys love commentaries? I'll say it like he says it, commentaries. You know, you ever wonder why they put so much uh, trust in the commentaries of these old dead people? Like what, what is, what fascination do people have with old dead people that makes them think that those old dead people had more knowledge and more awareness and more intelligence than people today? Is it just because they're old? I mean, is it just because they lived 500, 600 years ago, whenever it was? I mean, what compels someone to put so much trust in an old dead guy? Maybe they think, well, they were a little bit closer to the time Christ lived, so they must have more information. Wrong. We today are in the age of information. We today have all the information. We have unlimited resources. We have unlimited access to those resources. We have the internet, the World Wide Web, which gives us unlimited access to all sorts of information. There is absolutely no reason why anyone should be as ignorant as this guy. There's no reason for it. Okay, the only reason for it is sheer ignorance and sheer laziness to do the research yourself and to find the answers because the answers are all there. They're all there in history. Okay, and one of the biggest downfalls from any wannabe is that they just don't know the history of Israel. They don't know the events, the captivities, the, uh, the exiles, the bringing back of them to, from the nations. They don't know what God did with them as he sought them out from the nations once before in the Old Testament days and as he did it again in the final days before they were called up into their promise. They have no clue. They don't know about AD 70. They don't know about the destruction that took place there to end everything and destroy the temple. Heck, most of these futurists actually look at these Old Testament texts, right? Like Isaiah, Ezekiel, and they think that there's going to be a time in the future when the Jerusalem temple is rebuilt. Now, mind you, these are Christ followers who believe that there's no more need for animal sacrifice and everything, but they still are looking forward. They're actually hoping for it, for a temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Because they're looking at old ancient Israel texts like Isaiah, Ezekiel, and they're seeing all this talk of a rebuilt temple, right? A rebuilt city and a rebuilt temple. Well, all the while, everything's kind of just flying right over their heads because that already took place. Okay, when did that take place? That was the second temple period. That was the return from the nations, what the Jews still celebrate today called the return to Zion, second temple period where waves of Israelites came back to the land over a period of 110 years. I believe it's Rosh Hashanah, if I'm not mistaken, is what they call it when they celebrate that event today. But literally for 110 years, and you can read about it in the Old Testament, these waves of Israelites were being called back from the nations where, where they were driven. Okay, This is sort of like a first salvation uh, sort of type in the Old Testament where God is gathering the Israelites from the nations and bringing them to Jerusalem. And they're going to rebuild the temple, Ezra, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel. And you can read about that in Ezra. God literally made the nations pay for this temple and the re rebuilding of the city after the Babylonian destruction. He literally used the wealth of the nations. You know, Isaiah 60, the wealth of the nations shall come to you. That's the money from the nations God was bringing to Israel to rebuild the temple according to the Bible story. Who knows what actually really happened? But this temple was already erected. And these buffoons look at these Old Testament texts and they think that it's speaking of the future. Okay, it's just asinine. Jay Young, great Old Testament scholar. I've got, I've got a more modern commentary that the Southern Baptists put out from a totally different perspective by Miller. I looked at another commentary I looked at two Bible commentaries, uh, one volume Bible commentaries. I looked at more than one refer, uh, one study. So now he's, he's getting into all these commentaries of all these confused men, and he's going to, you know, he's building that up as to say, look, we all believe the same thing. Bible. And they all... Whoa. Whoa. What in the hell was that? What in the hell was that? This dude literally just growled. 
Did anybody else hear that? Let's go back and take a take a listen to that one again because that was interesting. Ready? And they all. Whoa! Is that the Holy Spirit? <laughs> all of them. Who? Oh. Said from chapter ten, verse one to chapter twelve, verse three, is Daniel's last vision. Okay, what's your point? Verse 2. I got to tell you, it, in terms of actually giving a sermon, this guy probably says the least amount of words of any pastor I've ever seen. I mean, he says like five words and then he stops for like 12 seconds before he says his next five words and then he stops. So he's basically getting people to come to the church, listen to him, put money in the bucket, and he's got to do... And he only has to do a little bit of work because he doesn't say very much. It's not part of the same passage as the talk about the tribulation. Verse 2 is about one thing. And from verse 4 or verse 5, they, they differ. From verse 4 or verse 5 is instructions to Daniel wrapping up the writing of the book and to take verse 2 and deduce that the second coming happened or happens before the tribulation and indeed in AD 17 is lousy careless exegesis of the word of God that's funny because Jesus in Luke 21 said very clearly that when you see the army surround Jerusalem, know therefore that all things written would be fulfilled. Does that include Daniel? Of course it does, right? Of course it does. Daniel was part of all things written, right? So Jesus actually believed that at the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 that all things written would be fulfilled. Jesus said that his coming would be fulfilled at AD 70. And he also said that the great tribulation would be fulfilled in AD 70 because guess what? At the coming of the Lord, what was he doing? He was coming for his saints, right? So if the great tribulation was on the saints and if the coming of the Lord was to, was to come for his saints, well, that means that they would be saved, right? No more tribulation when the Lord comes for them, okay? So that's why everything wraps up at AD 70. The coming of the Lord, the destruction of the temple, the end of the age. Did I say that strongly enough? Oh, yeah. It is a text without its context. Oh, he's getting fired up now. Calm down, old man. Take a break. 10. 11. All right. Okay. What we find... What we find is that as, as we talk with those leaning in this direction, almost whatever passage you turn to and say, well, here it is, it's, it, this is straight talk. The reaction is, oh no, you have to spiritualize that. So he's still talking about preterists. Now, he's talking about his interactions with inconsistent preterists who try to spiritualize everything in the, uh, in the New Testament in order to make the gospel still relevant to them today. My position and the correct position is Israel only. Okay, It's, it's full preterism mixed with Israel only, meaning that everything ended at the, at the coming. Right? There's no salvation and resurrection and judgment after the final resurrection, the final judgment, and the final salvation in the coming. There's nothing after that. This was an Israel-exclusive story. Jesus only came for the lost sheep of Israel. In the end, in Revelation, we see that only the 12 tribes are standing in heaven. All the ones who are being marked out and sought out by the Holy Spirit in the last days, great gospel commission were the tribes of Israel. Okay, the Holy Spirit was miraculously bringing them to the tribes, to the people. 
wherever they were, and they were being called out. Jesus said he knew his sheep. This is a Baptist church. I would assume that they understand the doctrine of sovereignty and election and things of that nature. So Jesus knew his sheep. Even the Gentiles were elect. Check out Acts 13. Paul says, even the Gentiles, only the, one, only the Gentiles who were appointed to eternal life, believed. Nobody else believed out in the nations. So the Holy Spirit, starting with bringing them to Cornelius, is leading them through this mission and finding the lost sheep. That's exactly what it was. And Jesus commissioned them. Remember, in Matthew 24, he says, Go to the nations, seek my elect, and do this before I come. Truly, all these things will take place in this generation. So it was all coming to an end. It was an imminent, urgent gospel mission. And so the true view is full preterist cessationism, meaning that it all ended and ceased at the coming of the Lord for his saints. John 6 says all the elect will be raised on the last day. That's the same last day Jesus spoke of, his coming. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 said Christ was the first fruits. Then those who are Christ would be raised at his coming. Then comes the end. Okay, then comes the end. Not a beginning, not a spiritualization like the full preterist inconsistent person does and says, sure, all this stuff already took place when, it's, when the Bible says it did, but we're still playing today post-resurrection, post-coming, post-final judgment. We're still part of the game. No, you were never part of the game. This was an Israel game only. So his argument here is against the inconsistence of which I wouldn't be. I believe that Christ literally came for his saints. Well, I should I should back that up and say I don't I don't truly believe the story happened. Okay, I'm, I'm heavily leaning towards that it didn't happen based upon the wild and wacky miraculous stuff that it says, um, and the lack of evidence that it happened beyond or outside of the Bible narrative. I should say, but uh, but I do believe that this is what the story says. Okay, that it, it says that Christ would literally return. He would come in the clouds just like he left. And he would come for his saints. They would literally ascend up into the heavens, changed into an immortal body in the flash of an eye at the very end. They would ascend up just like Christ did into the clouds where they would join the dead ones and forever be with the Lord. They would, he would transform their lowly mortal bodies to immortal, glorified, heavenly, angelic bodies like Christ received when he walked out of the tomb. So I do believe that that is the case. I do believe that that's what it shows. So I am not an inconsistent one who spiritualizes things anymore. I used to be. See, I've come through a few views. I've been where Mr. Pretlove here is. I was a Baptist fool for a while. Okay. And then I sort of progressed and I was an inconsistent full preterist who tried to spiritualize things to put myself in the game. But that didn't last very long. That was quick. Because I realized, eh, this is just dumb. <laughs> Everything already took place. I believe it. So what am I doing here? This is not... I'm not a, a Christ follower. I'm not a Christian. I don't have the Holy Spirit. I can't do greater signs and wonders than Christ did. Who am I kidding? The Holy Spirit was also for Israel too, by the way. Revelation chapter 7. But let's get back to this most boring sermon. Now listen. If anybody says to you, what the Bible says is not what it means. Wave a red flag. Wave a red flag. Okay, Mr. Pretlove. So when Jesus said to the people standing in front of him, not to you, because remember, Jesus is speaking to people. This is an account of him speaking to people. This isn't Jesus telling a scribe or a historian to write things down so that people 2,000 years from now in Las Vegas would understand them. This is somebody giving an account of a conversation that Jesus had with real living people in the first century. And in Matthew 16, we see Jesus say to them that some of them standing there before him at that time would not die until they saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So when somebody shows you that, Mr. Pretlove, it's clearly stated in the Bible, right? I'm showing you that. Then why aren't you believing it? Got to take a dose of your own advice. But this tendency to spiritualize everything that they, dis that they have to disagree with. It's something we have to deal with as we confront the error. And I came to the conclusion that the passage 
that you've got in that little pamphlet, whatever. The passage that talks about groaning is, i uh, put it like this. If I talk to you about the Holocaust, and if you've, if you've been to Jerusalem, I hope you have been to Yad Vashem and the Holocaust Memorial presentation. Get ready, this is good. Groaning. 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 So the Holocaust is, is what the Bible speaks of when it talks about creation groaning. That's basically what he's telling his audience now. You can't spiritualize groaning. And so, we look at chapter 8 of Romans and the passage there, starting in verse 17. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. Now let's stop there for a second. That needs to be understood in its context, right? Pret Love says a, con a text without a context is a pretext. Well, let's put some context on Romans 8. He's talking about the Spirit. And if they, Paul says to them, if they've received the Spirit, then they're sons of God. Well, guess what? <clears throat> guess who is getting the Spirit? We can flash back to the end in Revelation 7 and see. Revelation 7, verse 1 to, to 8. It's only the 12 tribes getting the sealing of the Spirit, okay? And then we see that they're the great multitude who came out of all nations, too. But if we go to Acts chapter 2, we can see it again from Peter. Peter, when speaking to the men of Israel, says, Men of Israel, the promise, he's talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit. He says, The promise is to you, to your children, and to all of you, Israel, who are afar off, as many as our Lord will call. So the promise was only to Israel, all right? The Holy Spirit was only for Israel. And we can see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, that it was only until they received their inheritance. That Holy Spirit would be a transitory vehicle given to the saints to carry them to the end, to, to help them persevere, to help them conduct their mission. It was called the Helper. Jesus was putting a mission before them to seek the elect, to fight and battle through the tribulation. And the way that they would do this was by way of the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, It would validate what they said. It would give them tongues to speak in other languages because, of course, they're going to lands far off where they would need to. Okay, And they were conducting great signs and wonders to validate what they said. I'm sorry, Mr. Pretlove, but growling at your congregation is not a sign and wonder. It just makes you look like a lunatic. So in Romans 8, we need to put this into its proper context. All right, Those who are receiving the Spirit and those who are uh, children and heirs are Abraham's seed. That's Israel. Okay, Abraham's seed is always Israel in the story. They're heirs according to promise. All right? Remember in the beginning when God promises that in your descendants many nations will be blessed? All right, he's calling back the Israelites from all the nations where they were. All right, and we see that uh, the um, the promise was to Israel. It was to Israel near and Israel far. All right, so we need to understand this in its context and not be so ignorant as Mr. Pretlove is here. But let's continue to listen to him butcher Romans chapter eight. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Seeing that we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now notice how ignorant this man is. Here's Paul in Romans 8 talking about the present time in which he wrote. Okay, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time 
right? What is that, folks? That's tribulation that they were going through. To bringing back what I said earlier, that the tribulation period was that last day's period where they were conducting the gospel mission. They were being opposed by the enemies of Christ, that being the Jewish community, those who were against the message. Because remember, the message is radically opposed to a lot of the things that the Pharisees and the Jews would have believed at that time. All right, so the enemies of Christ were the ones who were going to be put under his feet when he came. And who was that? Well, it was the Jewish system, the entire Jewish economy, the temple, the law, the sacrifices, the altars, all the people, over one million killed, many taken captive. This was the final judgment. This was the end of all things Old Covenant. And Paul is telling them, for he considers the sufferings of this present time. What present time? Not 2019 in Las Vegas at the First Baptist Church of Dr. Pre of Mr. Pretlove here, but the present time in which Paul lived, the present time which was the last days. So again, there's no context that this guy applies. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Oh, Not only that, now, but we hold ourselves on. who have the... Let's, uh, let's back up. So he said he's reading about the creation groaning, right? And remember, he's groaning, like he said, it's groaning. So he's reading about the creation groaning and he goes on and reads verse 22. It says, Paul says, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. <laughs> until now. Why, why until now? Well, because they were in the end. They were in the last days. Okay. And this groaning and laboring and everything was about to come to an end because they were about to inherit their salvation. Paul said, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed, speaking to real people. The best thing anyone can do when they're reading the New Testament letters is to understand that these letters were written to real people. Once you understand that, then you can start to apply a thing called audience relevance. That these letters actually meant something to the people who received them and who were going through the things contained within. All right, and if you forget how to do that, or if you never knew how to, how to do that, chances are you're a futurist. Once you start understanding how to do that, the Bible starts falling in line piece by piece by piece. And then eventually you get to where I'm at, where you see that it was only about Israel and it never had anything to do with you in the first place. And you, you step out of it all and you look back and you say, man, wow, how deceived was I? And how deceived are 2.4 billion people today? Because nobody studies the Bible. Right? And if they do and they understand it, they wouldn't admit it anyway because a lot of them are too vested like this buffoon. All right, but let's talk about that creation that he's talking about. Right, So Paul says in Romans 8 that the creation was groaning. Groaning, right? Well, what is that actually pertaining to? Well, <clears throat> again, if you know anything about the Old Testament, you know that Israel was always shown as groaning. Okay, I'll give you a little hint. Israel is the creation. Okay. And Israel was the ones that were going to be delivered. All right, but let's, let's look at some passages here, okay? In Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, we read this. During those, days, many, during those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out to God for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. Okay, look at Exodus, uh, let's see, Exodus 3, verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. Okay, look at uh, Exodus 6, verse 5. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Look at Exodus 6, 9. Moses relayed this message to the Israelites, but on account of their broken spirit and cruel bondage, they did not listen to him. Numbers 20, 16. And when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our voice. Okay, 1 Samuel 12, 8. When Jacob went to Egypt, your fathers cried out to the Lord. 
right? So what's the point here? The point is, is that all throughout the Old Testament, we have dozens of passages showing Israel groaning and crying out, okay? And the reason why they were groaning and crying out is because they went through a pretty hard history, okay? They were in captivities, they were in slavery, they were in bondage, they got exiled, they were slaves, they were brought back, they went again, the northern kingdom was taken out, the southern kingdom was taken out. All these events in their history of them groaning in bondage, in pain, in suffering, in torture. That's what Paul is speaking of here. The creation is Israel. What's that? You need a text to prove that? Isaiah 43, 15 says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel. Okay? Okay. Isaiah 43, verse 1. Now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Israel, and he who formed you, O Jacob, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Okay, so God created Israel. That's what it says. All right, he created them as his special people. It was the creation of the covenant people. And what you see in the beginning with Adam is sort of a microcosm of the covenant structure with the law, with a high priest. Because remember, Exodus shows, uh, Leviticus shows that when a high priest sinned, he brought guilt to the people. When he didn't, when he didn't abide by the law and he broke a, a, a commandment, he brought sin and guilt to all the people in covenant. That's exactly what happened with Adam. Adam was a covenant man. He transgressed the law and he brought guilt and condemnation to his people. So this is a covenant story from cover to cover. But the creation, the meat and potatoes of the story, zooms in on Israel. You got a 2,000 plus page book and probably all but 20 of the first pages are about Israel. It's Israel's story. It's their journey. It's their groaning their bondage, their burden, everything leading up through the ages, everything that they've been through. And boy, they went through a lot, didn't they, according to the story. But look at what Paul says. He says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subject, subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, wait a minute. If the creation is what this guy thinks it is, and it's about the world... Okay, the literal physical planet, the birds, the bees, the trees, the bears, the people, everything included in one. How does this passage make sense? Because look at what Paul says. He says, because the creation itself will be delivered from corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So wait a minute. The creation is going to be changed or delivered into children of God. So how does that work, Mr. Pretlove? Does that mean that God's going to take the entire planet and turn that into children of God? You see how stupid this idea is? Okay, the only way that this works is if the creation is Israel and it's being delivered from bondage and changed into the glorious freedom of children of God, which is exactly what happens at the end. Okay, at the final resurrection, they're changed in the twinkling of an eye to immortal, glorified children of God, taken up into their promise. Paul goes on, he says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Okay, until now. The whole creation. That's Israel. All right, let's see what else Mr. Pret Love has to say here. The first spirit, who have the spirit of the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So the adoption, now, in this hope, let me pause this for a second. Said, the adoption was for Israel. That Paul says that in Romans 9. He, this guy quotes Romans 8 and talks about the first fruits of the Spirit here. Well, we know from Revelation chapter 14 who were the first fruits. Well, go look, Revelation 14, it's the 12 tribes. And it says no one except the 12 tribes could learn the redemption song. So the 12 tribes were the first fruits. And no, first fruit doesn't mean second and third fruit and fourth fruit coming down the line. It simply means the choice, the chosen, the ones given to God, the portion that belonged to God. And that is exactly what Jacob was called all throughout the story. It was God's, he was God's portion, God's possession, God's inheritance. Hope, which is seen as not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await it with patience. 
There are some, a number of things we need to see in this passage. The first thing is that Paul talks about the times. In verse 18, he writes about this present time. Now wait for it. Is looking at this present time, he also has an eye on a future time as well. Yes, he does have an eye on a future time as well. But that future time, Mr. Pretlove, is not 2,000 years later, okay? That future time was going to be in their generation. This is Paul leading up to that coming that Jesus promised would take place before some of them standing there died. That's when they would be changed into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's when their corruption and bondage and everything would be done, right? They would no longer groan. There would be no more pain, no more tears, no more death. That's what they were looking forward to. That's the end. That's Christ coming, and he who endured to the end would be saved. So yes, he's looking forward to the future. Of course he is, because he's in the final last days. He's conducting the Great Commission. He's trying to get to that point where it would all come to an end and they would inherit the promise. But that was a lot closer than what these buffoons make it out to be. So he's looking at the present time with its difficulties and the fulfillment of the hope that we have. So Notice how these guys would have to say that the Great Tribulation period would be 2,000 years now, right? Because... Jesus clearly says that you're going to go through great tribulation, right? He's saying that to real people. So these guys would have to acknowledge that, right? Jesus is kicking off the great tribulation or a tribulation period. So essentially what they'd have to say then is the great tribulation period has now gone on for 2,000 years. The first thing you have is... And that doesn't even make sense because we know in Matthew 24 it says that he would cut that period short because nobody would survive if he didn't, right? So is 2,000 years being cut short? The times. The second thing is that you see that the creation was subjected to futility. This is good now. The creation was subjected to futility. Verse 20. God subjected it to futility. And Paul, of course, is looking back to the first chapters of Genesis. Here it comes. Verdict in Genesis 1, after the days of creation, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Evening came and then morning, the sixth day. God created a physical world with physical bodies for the animal kingdom and the human race. This is where he's talking that creation is the entire planet and it's cursed. There have been those at various times who have seen the body as bad, as evil. They've denied that Christ had a physical body that he did in fact come in the flesh. Look at 1 John verse 2. They spiritualized his body. Anyway, the creation was subjected to futility. God made it good, but then came sin and punishment, part of which... It's funny because he's got this all wrong again. Notice how he says that the creation was all good and then came sin and punishment. But that's not what the story says. Okay, the story shows that sin was in the world before the law, said Paul in Romans 5, but sin was not imputed where there was no law. It was the law when the law came and was transgressed. That's what brought the death. That's what brought the guilt and the imputation and the condemnation. But in Romans 5, 12, and 13, Paul's very clear that sin was in the world before the law, but sin was not imputed. Because it's not imputed where there is no law. This is exactly what Adam was doing in the garden. When his eyes were closed, he was naked and unashamed. His sin was in the world, but he had no imputation, right? Because it was no law. But when the commandment comes, he breaks that commandment and he dies. His eyes are opened. He realizes he's, he's naked. He re he's now ashamed. And he needs a covering. He needs a sacrifice. So the law 
is what the garden is all about. It's the start of the law. It's a microcosm of Israel's law. Okay, that system of death, that ministry of death and condemnation, the knowledge of good and evil. Well, what gives knowledge of good and bad? It's the law. It tells you what's good and what's bad. But before that law came, sin was in the world and wasn't a problem, right? Pret Love's head just exploded. Because that's the, the traditional Christian view is that sin was not in the world until Adam fell. But that's not what Paul says. Paul takes the audience back to a time when sin was in the world, but it wasn't imputed because there was no law. So the time of imputation that nobody would deny is when Adam violates the commandment, when he breaks the commandment. Paul describes it as, when the commandment came, I died. Right? He says, sin took opportunity by the commandment and brought the death. So you can see sin was always there. It wasn't the issue. What was the problem was when the law came, it brought, it gave sin its strength. The law gave sin its strength. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. And nobody else had the law, by the way. The only ones who had the law in this story are those in covenant with God. We clearly know that there were people outside of the garden because Cain goes and finds a wife and uh, he's afraid for his life. You know, like th this is just common sense stuff. So the ones who received the death, Adam was basically a high priest who uh, brought the guilt and shame to his people by violating the law, which matches Leviticus 4 when we see that that's exactly what was taking place with the high priest. They brought guilt to their people with a transgression. So it's all relative. And as you go through the story, you see the law is always there. It's there with Noah. He's, he knows the difference between clean and unclean. He's sacrificing animals. It's there with Abraham. It's there all the way through. And then when we finally get to Moses, now you have this codified, super expanded set of laws, which contains a lot of the same laws that Adam had. We, saw, we see Cain and Abel, they sacrifice and everything. But now it's just this mass of, of laws making their sin exceedingly sinful. God subjected the creation to futility. To the woman I will intensify your labor pain. Your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. To Adam, because you listen to your wife's voice and ate from the tree about which I've commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor. All the days of your life it will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you do return to the ground. For you were taken from it, your dust, and you will return to dust. The creation subjected to futility. Pain. Laborious work, frustration from weeds, death. Okay, so notice how he's talking about Adam's curse, and he clearly thinks that the, the ground is cursed, right? He, he would have to still think that planet Earth, the ground, is cursed, right? Now, first and foremost, I don't know about you guys, but I've been to some incredible places in the world. Places that would seem heavenly, okay? That just are unexplainable in their glory and beauty. Okay, it, nothing about this earth seems cursed to me in terms of the ground. It's, it's an amazing planet, okay? Of course, there's some dry and arid places and deserts and whatnot, but there are some unbelievably beautiful places on this planet, okay? Some very close to where a lot of us live. So to say that the ground is cursed is stupid, all right? To say that every man is cursed and that every man will have to work hard for his food is stupid, right? Because a lot of people do very well in life and work, you know, and make many hundreds of thousands of dollars and don't have to work hard for their food at all. In fact, a lot of them sit behind a desk in a nice air-conditioned room and just watch the dollars come in. So they're not working hard or sweating or, you know, working with the crops or anything for their food. No, not at all. And what's even more disturbing is that this man, right, he's totally unaware of what it says in Genesis chapter 8. Because remember, he's quoting Adam, the, the garden account, and he says that the ground is cursed. This is a promise. And now he's obviously saying that it's still cursed today because remember, he thinks he's part of the creation groaning. So this has been going on now for thousands of years and he's part of it. 
But look at what God says to Noah in Genesis chapter 8 when Noah comes off the ark, okay? He says in verse 20, he says, well, it says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. Well, there's an altar. He's going to sacrifice. Obviously, we see the law. Noah had the law. Noah was in covenant. God actually said to Noah, I will now establish my covenant with you. See, Noah was the only righteous man in the covenant. And by righteous, it means law abiding. Okay, that's what righteous means in the Bible. Law abiding. Okay, so Noah was the only one who took the law seriously, right? He was a righteous man. So God destroyed his people, destroyed the covenant people, preserved Noah and his family, put them on an ark, and then they come off, right? And now look what it says. It says, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird. Now, wait a minute. How does he know about clean and unclean if the law wasn't there? That's a law thing, isn't it? And look what he says. He offered burnt offerings on the altar. Clearly, law practices for their sin, for their transgressions. And then in verse 21, look, it says, And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma, and then the Lord said in his heart. Ready? Here it is. Here it is, Mr. Pretlove. Check it out. You ready? You listening? Stop growling. Okay? And listen. The Lord says, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. I will never again curse the ground for man's sake sake right there after adam after this supposed universal planet ground curse that every bonehead and their mother thinks is relevant today that somehow the ground and crops and agriculture and all these places in the world they're all cursed it's all cursed it's a terrible world terrible planet bad planet very bad planet okay But God says to Noah, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. So which is it? Doesn't Noah Noah come after Adam? So do you believe that the ground is cursed? Despite what God said that he would never again curse the ground for man? I think you found yourself in a pretty bad predicament there, Mr. Pretlove. But let's continue. Look around you and you see... Modern equivalents add in cancer three hundred a week dying of opioid drug. This is where he gets into the newspaper exegesis, mentions some of the most negative things he can find in the news, and tells and implies that it's related to what we find in this old antiquated collection of material that was written thousands of years ago. The number of abortions way above that. Corruption. Corruption in high places. Can you imagine a governor of a state and the legislative body of a state essentially saying that after a baby is born, it is okay to kill it. It is not murder. Talk about playing on the heartstrings, right? And, and manipulating people's minds. See, the thing... Uh, about this guy is he probably is going to leave this church driving his BMW back to his $400,000 home, right? Doesn't have a care in the world, right? He's not going through much tribulation. He has no tribulation. Nobody hates him for the sake of Christ, right? He uh, is referring to world events and things like abortion and saying that somehow that relates to what the Bible says. But overall, in terms of peace in the world, I mean, it's, let's put it this way, if you lived back centuries ago, the chances of you living a safe, free life were pretty slim, right? I mean, the times back then were pretty doom and gloomy, right? I mean, you'd be killed, your head would be cut off for just about anything, right? It was all about power, and there was some pretty, uh, pretty gruesome times in history, by and large, if you look at the world today, I mean, it's it's a pretty peaceful place besides the extremists and whatnot. But 
My point is, is that his view of the world is totally warped by um, his biblical worldview, right? He's basing everything he sees upon an old Hebrew salvation story. But if you really look at it, and there's was, there was a study done, um, I don't know who has it, where it is, but a lot of full preterists use it to help futurists understand that the world today, in terms of violence per uh, population, is actually far better than it was centuries ago. Um, so is the world becoming a better place? Who knows, right? I'm not, I'm not the person to say that. But to play on the heartstrings and like manipulate people's minds so that they think that the world is just such a horrific place because of, you know, abortions or homosexual relationships, whatever the case may be, is just stupid, right? It's, it's, there's nothing in the Bible to warrant him making that connection. If that's your personal opinion, fine, right? I don't agree with abortions either, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pro-abortion, but I don't condemn anybody who is anymore because I've come out of the religious mindset, okay? But point being is that this guy is doing newspaper exegesis. He's looking at bad and negative world events and he's bringing them up whenever he can so that he can get people to think that certain things that he's taking out of context in the Bible are actually related to what's happening today. It's a typical tactic of many futurist preachers. But the Bible is unconcerned. Chicago. Spending three trillion on health care. Can you imagine all the little slugs that are groaning right now out in the dirt piles? All the ants who are groaning as they work together to bring back food to their ant hills. Those poor little things, they're groaning. Creation is groaning, right? All the bears in the woods as they're hibernating, they're groaning. Poor little bears. Can you imagine how glorious it's going to be when creation receives its immortal bodies when those little slugs become immortal when those bears get their heavenly angelic bear bods can you imagine how glorious that's going to be when the planet becomes immortal right when the planet is redeemed and the the world becomes an immortal being can you imagine when creation is redeemed oh it's going to be beautiful do you see how stupid it is folks do you see why creation has to be the covenant people it has to be israel and that's totally backed up throughout the entirety of scripture. Creation is people in this context, and people were going to be changed into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The whole creation has been groaning together with labor pain until now. Until the now. The first, the times, the present time, and the future. Creation subjected to futility in the present time, and in the present time also, Sons waiting for adoption. Verse 20. And Paul says in Romans 9 that the adoption belonged to Israel. 23, not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now remember in Revelation 14, it says, No one, no one, except the 12 tribes, the 144,000, could learn the redemption song. No one. Okay? But here's Paul saying, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Well, if nobody except the 12 tribes could sing the redemption song, and if here's Paul telling these elect sheep in Rome, that they were waiting for the redemption of their body, then do you see how these elect in Rome are part of the 12 tribes? 
The fallen creation groans and the sons of God groan. So the ground is groaning, the slugs and bears are groaning, and the children of God are groaning. Make sense? As we're in the fallen creation. Fallen creation. Uh, I'm going to St. Lucia in a couple months. And I'm staying in a place that looks like it's uh, in the third heaven. Fallen creation? <laughs> I think not. God is affected by the fall. But the next thing we see is that God's sons are going to be revealed. Verse 19 in Romans 8, For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. A church without babies is dead adoption, the redemption of our bodies. And as Paul looks at the future for the Christian... Sorry about the motorcycles. It's a nice day here, so there's some bikes riding by. He finds it hard to talk about it without using the word glory. Look at it. Romans eight seventeen. We suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. I consider, verse 18, the sufferings of this present time aren't worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. The creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to futility in the hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Now, what's interesting is Paul elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 talks about this corruption, right? The bondage of corruption. And what does he say? He says, we shall not all sleep. He's talking, he's writing to real people. He says, we shall not all sleep, which is just die. It means die. We shall not all sleep, but we will be changed in the moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So clearly what Paul is saying is that there's going to be some of you that I'm writing to who will not die before the last trumpet. He says, at that last trumpet, we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We will put on immortality and incorruptibility. Well, that's the opposite of corruption, right? He says, the creation will be delivered from corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Well, there's Paul telling people that they would be changed from corruptible to incorruptible, from corruption to incorruption, from mortal to immortal. And they would be caught up together in the cloud. So, again, showing that the creation of Romans 8 is the people, it's the elect. And they would be changed from corruptible to incorruptible when they receive that promise. Which, by the way, Paul assured them would take place within the lifetime of some of those there whom he was writing to. Because remember, Jesus outlined that at the very beginning when he said, Some standing here will not die before I come for you. And it was going to be at his coming that they would be changed in the twinkling of an eye, put on that immortal body, defeat corruption, inherit immortality, and be caught up together with him. First Thessalonians 4 says, Some of you, uh, or, or those of us who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. All right, so we, again, he's writing to a body of saints in Thessal Thessalonica. And he's telling them that some of you will be alive and remain at the coming of the Lord. So that's why they were in the last days. The Lord was coming. He was coming quickly, at hand, soon, near. It was about to take place. Terms that Mr. Pretlove here has no clue. No clue what they mean. He's tying it together. He's saying the creation is groaning. We're groaning. groaning. And we are looking for... They were the creation, okay? It's not two different things. They were the creation. Our redemption, our being set free, and that is tied up with the creation itself being set free. Mm -hmm. So the world, the planet needs to be set free, folks. Paul seems to be saying that it's only when the sons of God are revealed in their glory that creation can be set free. That makes no sense. So the sons of God being revealed is going to set the planet free. That's just brilliant. 
the creation, verse 19, eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to futility in hope that the creation will be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. Looking at a few other passages, start of Revelation 21, you see the new heaven and the new earth, and in that situation, God dwells with his people, verse 3, and verse 4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Yep, and it's the people who have the name on the forehead, right? Those are the ones whom he's wiping the tears away. Well, guess who that was? Go look at Revelation 7 and 14, and you'll see it's the 12 tribes. It's the ones who were sealed on the forehead. It was the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, and that's why only Israel got the Holy Spirit, Revelation 7. That's why no one except Israel could learn the redemption song, Revelation 14. And that's why no one except the 12 tribes' names were written on the new city, Revelation 21. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer because the former things have passed away. And what was the death in the former things? Well, it was all tied to the law. The burden, the bondage, the condemnation, and wrath, the death that the law brought. Paul called the law the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Ironically, those same two things are what we see taking place in the garden when Adam falls. Okay, we see that now he's uh, condemned and he experiences death. Right? Paul says in Romans 5 that through one man, death and condemnation came to the people. Well, that's the same thing that Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says that the law brought. It brought death and condemnation. So the idea here is that the people who were under the law, who were under that death system, that bondage, that condemnation, would be saved, would be caught up together into their heavenly kingdom, would be in a new Jerusalem where there would be no more pain, no more tears, no more death because the law had passed away and all things were made new. The former things were no longer remembered. The gates on the city would never close because there was no night there showing that they would be safe, no threat of enemies, no need for the gates to be closed at night like the old city and they would be with their savior. They would follow the lamb wherever he goes. His name would be written on their foreheads and that's exactly what the story shows. It shows a riding off into the sunset, happy ending, fairy tale type, happy ending for the people of Israel. Like Paul said in Romans 11, when the fullness of the ones in the nations came in, all Israel would be saved. The whole point was all Israel saved. That was Paul's whole goal. That was the sum of all the parts. That was his end goal. And that's exactly what we see take place at the coming of the Lord for his saints. He came for his sheep. At the last trump, he descended with the cry of an archangel, changed them in the twinkling of an eye to incorruptible, immortal, angelic beings. They were caught up into the heavens, just like he was, where they joined the dead, and they would forever be with the Lord. And they were finally in that age to come, that heavenly promise that the 12 tribes served God, hoping to attain for all those generations that Jesus said would result in them never dying anymore, never marrying anymore, because they'd be like angels in heaven. That's what they received at the end. And that's why they were in the last days, folks. That's why Mr. Pretlove here was not in the last days, because they were in the last days. Okay, The last days doesn't extend 2,000 years, all right? The whole entire Mosaic Covenant was about 1,500 years long, according to estimation. So the last days is now 500 years longer than the entire Old Covenant. Totally stupid, because the last days were the last days of the Old Covenant. And they were about 40 years from the time of Christ's death to the time of his coming, which took place at the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and the end of the age. Folks, that's where I'm going to cut it. I cannot subject you to any more of this boring torture by Mr. Pretlove. Hopefully he will watch this and he will learn that he is a bonehead 
And I hope that many people in his congregation will take what I said here seriously and give it some thought and um, come out from this false system that he's preaching. He's growling at his congregation. He's boring them to sleep and he's collecting their hard-earned dollars in the process. Don't be deceived, people. This is all a gimmick and had nothing to do with you in the first place. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a like, a rooski. We'll be back another day, another time, another place, and another rhyme. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.